What a warm, lovely welcome to get. <laughs> We're going to have to do this quite a lot. It's quite a wonderful round room. Thank you for being here, Varna. Um, first of all, get in a response when you walk out to a room for the work that you've done and you get that kind of response. How does that make you feel? Well, it was not completely in vain. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, first of all, before we dive into this incredible career, what inspires you to continue to make films and films that I kind of feel more so than ever really encourage us as an audience to address and explore humanity, I think? Well, we should be cautious about what I'm trying to explore, but uh, <laughs> I've always been curious and films have always come with uh, great vehemence at me, so I deal with what comes with... Uh, with the biggest kind of momentum and uh, what uh, I can't avoid anymore. It's, I keep saying sometimes it's like the burglars in the middle of the night coming at you and one of them is swinging wildly at you, so you, you deal with that uh, first <laughs> and foremost. It's a great, uh, it's a great so. example. You said that you, um, you have to have no prejudice when making a film, you have to be curious. And I want to ask how you maintain that. Well, uh, sometimes there is some sort of a prejudice, meaning a stylistic prejudice. I, I know when I do a film about the fires in Kuwait, I've seen it every night in 10 seconds clips uh, on the news, uh, that uh, the, the oil wells, I'm speaking of the first Kuwait war when the entire country was burning, All, every single oil well was on fire. And I had the feeling uh, uh, this looked really awful and, and it was just uh, a media sort of uh, way to deal with it. And I, I had the feeling I should do it, I would do it, number one, much better. And number two, I would completely stylize it. And I would stylize it in form of a science fiction film. So. Sure, there is a stylistic prejudice mm. of approach already there. And uh, certain things that I'm doing... Uh, I, oh, by the way, we have a clip. Can we show the, uh, the beginning of uh, Lessons of Darkness? Because it's an interesting, an interesting moment. Whenever you are ready, please just roll it, Lessons of Darkness. It's a very opening of it. Can, can we leave the microphone open so that uh, I can communicate back there? So interesting here is, uh, that's the film I mentioned in, in Kuwait. I started right away like a, like a science fiction film and it starts out with a, with a quote from the French philosopher Blaise Pascal. Mm. Uh, the collapse of the stellar universe will occur like creation in grandiose, splendor, wonderful observation about our universe. However, it is not Blaise Pascal, I invented it. I made it up. <laughs> and uh, Pascal, by the way, Pascal couldn't have said it better anyway. <laughs> so, uh, but it, it transports the audience because of this uh, caption. Mm. Uh, the audience is transported, elevated into a very high level already. You step into this film and you will accept things on a very high level. And, uh, and then, uh, for example, it's, you see this smoldering or this fog in valleys and wide mountain ranges enshrouded in mist. The mountain ranges were actually not mountains. There were tracks of tractors, something like only 10 centimeters high. Amazing. And, and it was uh, smoke in between and I filmed it in close-up and, and I did, by dint of declaration, those are mountain ranges. And then the first alien that we encounter wanted to signal something, something to us. And you are immediately in a science fiction film. And science fiction because uh, you see, for 60 minutes, you see a planet that we do not recognize anymore. It's, it cannot be our planet, yet we know deep inside, throughout the film as an audience, we know it can only be uh, our own planet. Mm. And um, so I, it's, it's wildly, wildly stylized. And I, 
uh, I like to show something like this because uh, what I see in the catalog of uh, this festival and other documentary festivals, uh, and almost everything is an extension of journalism. And it's not filmmaking, it's journalism. Uh, and, and I don't like this kind of uh, way that uh, documentaries are, uh, are conceived mm -hmm. and seen and, and understood. I don't like this anymore, it, it's dusting out of my ears and I'm sick and tired of it. <laughs> and, uh, and when I see something National Geographic at the, at the airport hotel or so, I immediately switch it off. You, you see, National Geographic would never have allowed me to do such, such a thing. Yeah. Uh, impossible. So you have to roll up your sleeves and do your own stylizations, your own filmmaking, your own uh, way to decipher the world. But even you getting to Kuwait and being able to capture images for that was a journey in itself for you. And, you know, you, you have to kind of weave your way into it. It's not an easy process even getting there to film it. Yes, I, I was editing a film at that time and uh, I kept saying to my editor, I should go there and should make a film and try to get... You had to have a permit by the Ministry of Information and, and it was lost. In, um, in bureaucracy there, and I never got a permit. And then I heard, I read somewhere that a Brit, uh, Paul Bariff, uh, was planning to go there, and I had the feeling he must have a shooting permit. <laughs> and I contacted him, and we met briefly in a hotel room in, in Vienna, and, and yes, he had a crew, and he had a helicopter pilot, and he had cameras all ready, and the permits, and I said to him, Paul, uh, I love your work. He's, he's one of these, of, of these terriers who does yeah. films dangling down from a rope from a, uh, from a sea rescue helicopter and filming a rescue. And I mean a tough, a tough yeah. guy and very fine cinematographer. And I said to him, Paul, uh, let me be blunt. I would like to direct the film and push you out. Is it okay that you... <laughs> is, it, is it okay that you only will be the cinematographer and the producer of the film. And he just stood up and he said, it would be an honor. And we were, so we were in business. Of course, his input is beyond what he did as a cinematographer. So I, I love him for that. And uh, so in, in a way, I jumped on, on a moving train. So you have to be smart. You have to, to take initiative. Mm -hmm. That's what I very often do not see with young filmmakers, not enough initiative, just, mm. just try and, and not enough uh, criminal energy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see it so much and, and you, have to, you have to have it in you if you, if you do this kind of work. And I, I do remember what comes to mind is I had spoken with a young filmmaker who made a film in Portugal about school kids about seven, eight, nine-year-old school kids. And the film was quite good and was sold to an American TV network. And they immediately asked, do you have all the, <coughs> do you have all the releases? Yes, he showed uh, all the parents had to sign and the school itself had to agree that the filming was done and one was missing. And he said to me, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. I, I tried to contact the kid and the family, but they had moved away and we couldn't locate them. I, I, engaged, uh, I engaged a private detective and I spent, <laughs> no, actually he spent thousands of dollars in tracking down this family. After five months, he finally found the family. 20,000 pounds later, he found the family and I said to him, you know what, give me a release form <laughs> and give me a pencil. <laughs> And I will, do the, uh, I will do the release for you in less than 10 seconds. <laughs> and you will have it. And, and you see, bureaucracy loves to munch on paper. That's their nature. You feed them with paper. You just put a name in and you put a wild flourish of a signature uh, under it and, and you're in business because the family, the missing family, is never going to sue you. They were okay with the filming. So, but it's, it's this kind of bureaucracy that you have to bypass, cheat out 
yeah. uh, befuddle them, bamboozle <laughs> them out of their wits, give them, give them paper, give them numbers that they will never understand, but they keep busy. <laughs> So that's, that's the way you have to deal with them. It's like a bureaucratic paper yeah. shredder. I like yeah. it. Yes, but, uh, but at the same time, the, the um, readiness uh, to uh, accept a certain amount of criminal energy. Otherwise, you are not going to make uh, films that are worthwhile to be made. Okay. Um, well, on this particular film, the, your, um, your words, your, your voiceover on this film is, is incredibly poetic and that's another one of your many talents, but you have an extraordinary eye for things that you're able to vocalise with just such profound imagery that you create through these words. And I wanted to ask about the process of that side of it with your filmmaking in terms of at what point are you thinking about yeah. the words that you're going to say? Well, yes, I, I think my, my voice has somehow caught on with audiences I like. How I, how I speak, although my accent is awful, but it's okay, I accept that and they accept it. But it's not only the voice and the kind of how I proclaim, how I pronounce things, it's also the writing. Yeah. The, it's because it's always self-written texts. And the texts are unusual and odd, for example, at the end of the, of the film on volcanoes, it's called Into the Inferno, I say things that National Geographic would never allow you to do, like the Blaise Pascal uh, <laughs> quote, they would never allow such a thing. Uh, and at the end of, uh, it's, it's a content, at the end of Inferno, I'm saying something about, you see lava and boiling things, and, and my voice says, but it's the writing, the idea, uh, this boiling lava is everywhere under us, on all continents, under all seabeds, and it wants to burst forth uh, and, and uh, destroy everything. And it is monument, and, and this kind of energy down there and this boiling mass is monumentally indifferent to uh, scarring roaches, retarded reptiles, and vapid humans alike. <laughs> so, and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the way I say it is really significant. All of a sudden, people are uh, stunned. <laughs> yeah. or in, in the film on Chatwin, I see a house that a, a British uh, uh, sailor built himself who became uh, the, um, uh, the British consul in Punta Arenas in southern Chile, at the tip of South America. And he says, he, and, he, and we see the building, and he built this phenomenally ugly house for himself. <laughs> and everybody is jolted in the audience. <laughs> yes, it is phenomenally ugly, but nobody pronounces it. Yeah. You see, it's, it's a no-no in cinema. They, they don't do it, but I do it. <laughs> and, and, and I would encourage you as filmmakers, and I mean, probably most of you are filmmakers here, yeah, you, you have to... You have to, to spring into the best that's in you. Mm -hmm. Just let it, let it come out because we are filmmakers. We are not the observation camera uh, in, in, on the wall. We are not the fly on the wall. And I hear it quite often. We should be like the fly on the wall. No, I rehearse, I stylize, I uh, script. And I'm speaking of documentaries mm. now. And I do completely wild uh, things, uh, and, and it's totally fine. Mm. Maybe we could show um, the end of uh, my film <clears throat> on the cave, Paleolithic Cave. Yeah, of course. Cave of Forgotten of Dreams. Yeah, let's do it. And it is uh, 052, the clip is 052, and it's a postscript to a I mean, it's so wild, it has nothing to do with a Paleolithic cave, <laughs> absolutely nothing. It has to do with perception. How would crocodiles moving towards the cave now see the paintings of the cave that are undecipherable for us? Can we show 052, please? That notion of fabrication, imagination, and stylization that almost give a documentary even more depth and truth than the truth can. 
Yes, uh, it's, uh, this, this kind of, of imaginary things, and of course audiences love this postscript because I take them straight into the realm of poetry and imagination. And, and audiences are very happy about that. And, and of course, uh, I do these stylizations and I modify what I see. Uh, and, and I have to quote the French writer André Gide, who once uh, famously said, I modify facts in such a way that they resemble truth more than reality. So that's a very profound statement. And I, I really like it. And, and Shakespeare, by the way, said, the um, most truthful poetry is the most feigning. So, thanks God, I have some big witnesses out there <laughs> uh, on, on my side. So, uh, I have the feeling, and I try to encourage you when you're uh, filmmakers, you, you just go for, for a deeper vision, go beyond journalism. It, do you think that goes way back, though, to when you first discovered or were, were exposed to film? Because you weren't as a child until about 11 years old. And I, I heard you talk about a travelling projectionist who came and you watched a film. I think it was about Eskimos. And because yeah. you grew up in, in that world of, you know, ice and snow, and you knew that world, and you knew how people navigated their way through it, and you watched these Eskimos on screen, you're like, they're not Eskimos. You know, they, these are all quite clearly actors the, in a documentary, because yeah, you're they were like, paid, that's not... Yeah, <laughs> paid extras, apparently, yeah. who had no... No clue how to deal with snow and ice. <laughs> yeah, so you were. So they did a very lousy job. <laughs> and it was my first experience with cinema, and I, I didn't even know that cinema existed until I was 11. It was very disappointing, and I thought, well, fairly early it dawned on me I, I would be a poet and I would be a filmmaker and I would do it much better. <laughs> so. But this, but this wonderful thing that you have where truth isn't really connected to fact. Truth is a, the creativity that you attach to truth. Truth, sorry, is, yeah. is I think one of the wonderful things about your filmmaking. Yeah, and it goes into into feature films as well. Yeah, and and sometimes I, I use pure imagination. Actually, we have a fine clip from Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, uh, New Orleans. We have, uh, if you could prepare, but I have to say a few Which things one? before that. What was it? Uh, Mm. We've got the two clips, we've got... No, no, we should have only one from uh, 050... No, sorry. Uh, 003. It's 003, but hold the clip for a second. <laughs> um, we have a, a situation where the bad lieutenant, played by Nicolas Cage, is, is completely full of, of, of drugs. And he's delirious, and he meets other homicide detectives on a on an observation outpost. They watch a, a house across the street because one of the uh, suspects appar apparently is hiding there. And he sees iguanas on the coffee table, but the other detectives, the homicide detectives, they look at the table and they say, there ain't no iguanas. <laughs> but he, in his haze of drugs, sees them. But the funny thing is now, we as an audience see it as well and you create an immediate conspiracy between the protagonist of the film and us as mm -hmm. the audience. And besides uh, the iguanas, we, we filmed it, much of it is the regular camera with which we did the dialogue, and some of it is iguanas in extreme close-up, and when it comes to this kind of filming, I do it myself. So I was a cinematographer, and, and I had a, a fiber optic cable a flexible fiber optic cable, and I would, I would uh, move cautiously, but really close to the skin of the iguana, and move along towards the eyes, and they look, in a way, I wanted them to look as stupid as it gets, <laughs> and, and as perplexed as it gets. And I had a light shining right into my camera, so that the stylization becomes visible. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, how can I say, all of a sudden you, you are transcending what you see in a, in a normal detective story. Can we play the clip 003, please? <laughs> so good. <Yeah. laughs> so, 
this is this is really fine filmmaking. <laughs> so and uh, and uh, uh, you see, you you have to have the courage to do something like that. Yeah. Uh, you will not see such a thing in a Hollywood movie. They are too too much formalized and too much uh, scared. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but but the industry. The, the big industry does not allow you to do a thing like that. So, and you have to to step beyond what the rules, the so-called rules, are. And I've always felt uh, that I was the inventor of cinema in a way. Um, and sometimes, in in this, for example, the cinematographer Peter Zeitlinger, he he had removed my light. He said, "Oh, it shines into your into your tiny lens." I said, "I need this light. Let's put it back." And he said, but nobody does it like this, and, and it looks awful. And so I said, let it look awful. I know what I'm doing. And, and by the way, let's not care what the rules are and what the <laughs> industry is doing. We are inventing cinema here. We are still inventing. And until today, I'm, in a way, feeling like inventing yeah. cinema. Do you feel like that with every film, with every project? In a way, yes. Not, not every, for example, the film on... Mikhail Gorbachev, meeting Gorbachev, uh, you, you have to be within the strictures of what a documentary normally would be because you cannot have albino crocodiles uh, in a film on Mikhail Gorbachev. So, of course, the, the content, the substance of a film, in a way, dictates the yeah. form. So, and I have no problem to do, to do a film on meetings with Mikhail Gorbachev. That, that clip as but well. But it's more an exception. Yeah, that clip as well is the most perfect choice of track, music track as well. Please yes, release me as well. Yes, but uh, we should be cautious about music. For yeah. that, I would need ten of you, and it's we should day. spend the yeah, hour five days. We should <laughs> and, and look at many examples because it's very hard to verbalise uh, what music does in cinema. But of course, here you see it, it's an example where where music transforms what you see into something even wilder. Yeah, you heard the laughter that rippled around the room as well. Yes, just... and it's, it's very well chosen yeah. music. Um, how do you know, you know, you documentary feature film and stuff, do you, how do you know what you want to do next? Do you work like that in terms of, I want to do another documentary or I want, do you? Oh no, for God's sake. Uh... <laughs> I'm, I'm not planning my career. I've never had a career. Uh, I, I just plow on and, uh, and while I'm sitting here, I should be actually shooting. I shouldn't be here. Uh, and, and of course, there's quite a few projects and, and, and they're coming at me and I, I, I never have been fast enough to, to keep abreast with a river the torrential river that's going there and I cannot keep abreast with it. And uh, so I, I work fairly fast, a screenplay I write normally in less than a week. Uh, and editing like Grizzly Man was done in nine days. And I've shot a feature film now in Japan, Family Romance LLC, which I did after the film on Bruce Chatwin and after the film on Gorbachev. Um, and for the entire film, the grand total of footage that I shot is slightly over 300 minutes. I'm saying minutes, not hours. It's 300 minutes. That's and uh, some of the scenes are in one take and I could shoot them only once because I knew I would be arrested if I repeated it at high security area, for example, at the platform. Uh, of the high-speed train, the bullet the train, train in Tokyo, yeah. because there was an attempt to firebomb one of those trains. It's security everywhere, security cameras everywhere. So I rehearsed the scene with three actors on a different level where there were tens of thousands of people milling around and I was rehearsing in the middle of it. And uh, also significant, I did my own camera. I, there was no cinematographer. I did the camera with a small, very high caliber 4K camera with very professional sound, but tiny, tiny, tiny. You wouldn't even notice in a crowd that I was filming and that I was filming a feature film. And uh, so I watched the train coming in and it comes to a stop and it stops exactly so 60 precise. seconds. 
and then it dashes out, and so the scene could be only 70 seconds. So I timed it well in rehearsing, and then I shot in 30 seconds into filming. I saw security, four security people rushing at me, but they were frantically calling for backup. And I saw them with my other eyes and kept filming, filming, Whilst filming. filming. <laughs> and then we were prepared what to do in such a case. You disperse, you do not make eye contact. You don't make eye contact, you just disperse in seven different directions. <laughs> uh, and, and I said, I go for the security guys. <laughs> and what you do in such a case, or for example, when you are in customs, and they, they are curious, what do you have on your cart? And, and are you suspicious or, or not? You, I, I have to demonstrate from behind here. Uh, you're just you're a security person or a, a customs guard. Mm -hmm. And I look at somebody who isn't there, an imaginary friend, and I look at him and I walk straight through them and I say, Hast du ein Harti gesehen in Bavarian? Have you seen my friend Harti? And I, I walk straight through them and they step aside and I'm out. So, that's, that's, for, never make eye contact, but go, <laughs> go for the enemy where, where uh, he comes at the thickest. <laughs> I, I, but this, I love this whole approach to filmmaking where you, you know, it, it's, the whole experience is, is, a, is, is exciting. It just sounds no, like... No, no, it's, forget about the no. experience. <laughs> No, it's... Uh, I'm excited hearing about I'm it. No, I'm not out for experiences. I am not <laughs> out for, for excitement. To get the shot. I want to get the shot and I'm a professional man and I want to get away with it and I do not want to have my footage confiscated or so. I just want to do the shot. <clears throat> the excitement I only feels when I talk about it. It's, but it was, it was a, a, a chain of banalities and you do the right thing, you have to read <clears throat> you have to read correctly what do security people do. Mm -hmm. This and, is from experience, obviously, that you now know you can go you, all these different parts of the world. You go, you, well, I know I'm only going to get away with this if I do this once. Yes, and, and you better know about the world when you are making films. And for example, I was uh, at two in the night on, uh, on freeways in Mexico City. There are these overpasses, five lanes, freeways crisscrossing or going around in, in Mexico City and at two in the morning, police, a big police car screeching comes by and forces me to a stop. And police jumps out and, and tries to force me out uh, on, uh, on, on the way, on the next exit out. And I look down and it didn't look good. And I look at the police and I instantly knew this was not police. And I jumped, I have no cell phone, I jumped to the next lane <clears throat> and, and there was still quite some traffic at two in the morning. I stopped an entire lane and I, I shouted at them in, in Spanish, uh, call the police, those are gangsters here. And I stopped the next lane and the police fled. Uh, there were gangsters. Uh, and I could tell they had perfect uniforms. The car was in total regular order like a police car. And then next morning we learned that at this place people were taken out and there were murders there, women were raped. It's awful, awful, awful. But I see, I see that they are not police. I see it. And, and you have to have it in you if you make films. You have to read the world, you have to read the signs, you have to read the situation. You also have to not have peripheral vision by the sounds of things as well. You know, you've got a camera there on this train sta station platform in Japan, but you can see everything. You're aware not of everything, everything else no, that's going on as well. Not everything, no, because otherwise I do not see exactly what's behind me. But, <laughs> but with, my, with my other eye, I'm, I'm scanning and I see what's coming from, from the side and is a person all of a sudden ending up in my shot? And if so, I would try to incorporate that straggler who ends up in my scene. <laughs> So, uh, yes, you, you better have more than just the eye. And I, I do not want to look at a flip screen. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an awful way to... And people normally look uh, at under eye level at a, at a flip screen and, and, and they, they lose themselves in flip screens. And I, I would never allow that. I do not allow uh, video play out uh, on, on my set. 
neither in documentaries nor in feature films. Why? I just, because everybody is distracted by, by screens that are there and, and I've been at a Hollywood shoot and I arrive at the, at the set and I see literally 30 asses looking at something <laughs> <laughs> and there were three screens, the so-called video village, as yeah. they call it. And everybody was looking at the screens. And nobody was looking at the actors who were, who were at arm's length away from them. They don't watch it anymore. And, and it's completely misleading and distracting. What you see on a screen can be very, very misleading. It can look wrong, on the, but in context, all of a sudden, it looks right. Mm. And there are endless discussions and endless repetition. And then endless, uh, endless, uh, uh, what shall I say, collecting of footage. They call it, um, what do they call it, coverage. And I didn't even know what they meant by coverage when I shot uh, Bad Lieutenant and I secretly had to ask my assistant director, I know what coverage is in my car insurance. If you are <laughs> riding with me, and if, if I crash, Cover it, you will be covered for <laughs> medical expenses up to a quarter of a million dollars or so. And he said, no, it's a shot very close in the wide and from above and from here. And I say, now I'm doing what, what I need for the screen. I film what I need and that's because of that my shooting days are very short. Mm. Uh, at 3.30 my day is over and I can't move to the next uh, scene because uh, the set is not ready and the actor hasn't arrived yet. He was going to arrive at night by plane. So, so I said, okay, let's call it quits. And we became very insistent until Nicolas Cage said, give me an apple box or something. He stepped up at it, called the crew and he said, uh, crew, listen, you speak of coverage. Finally, I'm working with a man who knows what he's doing. <laughs> so, and and it's, he was completely right, and from then on, uh, silence about coverage. <laughs> Don't mention and, it. And when, when, you look, when you look at shooting uh, very often multiple cameras, and they only shoot coverage, they mm. do not know what they are doing, they do not know the central focus, the attention, the very shot for which you have to go, and they collect footage, 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 and it's all garbage, it's all mediocre, and they concoct a story out of it in post-production. They move the decisions into post-production mm. where it should not be. It should be when you are filming. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to talk to you about that, because one of the things that you said is you can't make a film, you can't solve a film in, in post, you shouldn't solve a film. Bad acting you cannot so, solve in post-production, <laughs> for example. So. Uh, you, you, have to be, you have to be prudent and you have to know what you are doing. Can we talk about Grizzly Man, if you don't mind, please? We have a, a clip from Grizzly Man. <laughs> Do you, um, when I watch back that last piece to camera that he did, it's, it is like he's saying goodbye. You kind of feel yeah. like, almost like he knew. Yes, and it's a tape that we discovered very late in editing. And it was the very last shot that he took of himself. And he uh, was eaten by a bear in the next morning. So, and his girlfriend, unfortunately, as well. Mm. So it's, uh, nobody should die that way. But uh, it happened and it was, uh, and the film is very much about uh, uh, wild nature and the Disneyization of wild nature and this kind of, of, of profound misunderstanding of what constitutes wild nature. So, uh, in a way, um, it's, a, it's a very profound film and of course Treadwell has left us footage that nobody has ever filmed and we'll never have that again. So, it's a, it's a film very, very much a tribute to him as well although it shows his stupidities and his weaknesses and his craze and, his, and also his prudence and mm. his uh, noble side. So it's a whole facet of, of one person. The, uh, the, the footage was very, very well selected. And of course, again, the, uh, the pilot who is, was his friend who is flying, um, it was staged. We had, I knew this was gonna be the song for the end. And I had uh, the, um, uh, the, the pilot sing along 
with, with a song. And I, at the end he says, and I think and the red wolf is gone, and I said to him, sing, and Treadwell is gone. So it's staged. And uh, because it is staged, it becomes more truthful. And it's not, it's not into trying to give you fake news. And, and the, the pilot is, is really uh, totally laconic and, and wonderful because he's very, very well staged, very well directed. That's what I do in documentaries. I direct, I direct them. Was it an easy film to find the story about Timothy that you, that, you know, to find that of how you would tell his story? Because there was a lot of footage of his. But yeah, then about a hundred hours, and, and I shot maybe four or five hours myself. Half of the film was done with uh, a few hours of film that I shot. Because you had nine days to hit that deadline for the Sundance. Yeah, thing. it was it was a little bit silly because I finished the film, shooting the film, and then uh, started editing. It was 20th of September. I remember in that I. The producer said to me, oh, this looks fantastic. We should, that would be a film for Sundance Film Festival. And I said, I'm not making films for a festival, but uh, let's look, it can do it easily because it's end of January. And he said, yeah, but there's a glitch. And I said, what is it? Submission ends in 10 days from now. <laughs> and I said, let me try. And I've delivered it in nine days. And uh, you see, I see many young filmmakers, documentary filmmakers in particular, they come with me with great pride. I shot 650 hours of footage. My heart starts to sink right then and there. And I'm editing since a year and a half. That really is the, the industry, the business of making films, the costs of making films does not allow that. You see, it becomes too expensive. You have to stay. If you want to have a longer range survival in, in filmmaking, you have to, to know what time and money means and what it costs and how to be responsible with your time and with, with the cash flow. And you have to learn it. You have to, in feature films, I, I have in my contract that I have the right to look at the daily cash flow at night with a, a key accountant and with a line producer and I do it, I keep the finger at the pulse and I see immediately what is going wrong. From the cash flow, daily cash flow, you know instantly. Mm -hmm. And I said to the producer, I, I try, I've done 70 films, none of them over budget, five of them under budget, this may be the sixth because I think there's a little bit of cushion here, a little bit of cushion there. And he says, nobody brings in the film under budget. And I said, I try, but I want to have a bonus. And a good <laughs> bonus, yeah. And it's a film which was $19 million. I brought the film back on his table, $2.6 million under budget. It's completely unheard of. In, I hope that was your bonus. <laughs> my, my bonus was, was somehow, uh, the, the higher my... Uh, savings were the more I would get. So I earned much more than for my fee and my bonus. And in addition to that, the uh, producer wants to marry me. And uh, keeps, keeps sending me screenplays on a weekly ba basis. And I send it all back to him and I say to him, he's an Israeli ex-army major. I say to him, Avi, this is all garbage again. And he says, okay, I'll send you another one next week. <laughs> so it's, it's not going to happen like that. <laughs> what, what is it about a, a script, though, that you, you look for or that, you, that, that, I don't know, connects with you in a way? Oh, I write them myself. I do not look for scripts. Uh, Bad Lieutenant was an exception. Yeah. Uh, there were two exceptions out of, um, I don't know how many films. So uh, it has, I, I instantly, as a storyteller, I instantly know this is big. It's so big that I have to do it. Mm. And uh, so it, it happens like that. Um, I wanted to ask about how you, you know, whether you're going to sit down in a room with Mikhail Gorbachev or whether it's Elon Musk or whether it's someone on death row, how you approach those situations and what your preparation is for... Well, I try... <laughs> For Gorbachev, of course, that's an exception. I, I read his biography. I spoke to people who knew him for decades. I read transcripts of 
uh, Supreme Soviet Secret Sessions before he was now published uh, and, and on. So I did a lot of homework. Normally I, I go in unprepared. And uh, for example, it's, it's quite interesting to speak about very limited possibilities that sometimes you have and you have to function. And people, young filmmakers ask me, what is your technique of interviews? Number one, I do not do interviews, I do conversations. And uh, you have to learn it in life itself, uh, traveling on foot or reading. And so you have, to, you have to know the heart of men. You have to know and you have to look instantly deep inside of them. And you would know and figure out, and I, I have a fine clip for that. Into the Abyss, uh, it's about uh, complicated murder stories, two murderers, three murder victims, four crime scenes, people who knew the murderers, and there was, a, uh, there was a young lady who was a bartender, and uh, after the murder, both uh, perpetrators went to the bar and started to brag about whom they shot. And she came, I filmed with her, she came with a young man uh, next to her, and she says, oh, I brought Jared with me, uh, say hello, Jared, because he knew the two guys as well. And I said, Jared, maybe we can also speak on camera, but please move out of sight, move out of earshot because I'm speaking to her now. Don't listen in and so. And I filmed with her and I said, Jared, can you please? And he said, oh, no, no, I have to leave in 10 minutes. I, I have to be on a roof and I have to do roofing. And I said, come on, step here. And, and, and I put him in front of the camera. I knew nothing about him. And, and I can show you the first moment I had with him and I, I met the man only for 10 or 12 minutes in my entire life. And the uh, murderers on death row and one of them was executed eight days later. You have exactly 60 minutes, but 10 minutes you need quickly setting up your light, your camera, the, the microphone and so, and, and, and that's it. And you have to, that's the only chance you have. The only. And for example, the, uh, the, I, the film begins with the uh, chaplain of the death chamber. He, he's there for, for the people who die. And he speaks in front of, he comes rushing to me and says, quick, 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 I have to be in the death house in 20 minutes. And I said, Reverend, I thought it was in the afternoon. No, no, let's go. I said, yeah, okay, let's do it. And he speaks about... Uh, executions and so like like a, in a show talk show <laughs> and very shallow and so and, and he speaks about how beautiful God's creation is and he drives in his golf cart in the morning and there's dew and sometimes he sees deer and a squirrel and he sees a horse looking at him and I stop him and now you will never learn it in a film school or anywhere only in life I stop him and I say reverend tell me about an encounter with a squirrel, and he comes apart, he unravels. All of a sudden, he becomes deep, and it's un an unbelievable moment. But I'll show you Jared Talbot from the, the man whom I, I met, um, number 057, please. Um, and it's the very first moment I had with him. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, there's also a really good example of um, encounters at the end of the world where you, the scientist that you speak to, um, who had not, had he not spoken to someone in like a very, very I, long I, time? I, uh, there was a, a scientist uh, and everybody who, who was studying a colony of penguins. And I said to myself, since at, at that time there was this big Disney film coming out, Happy the March, March, March of the, the penguins. penguins, yeah, and Happy Feet, it's all the sort of Disneyization of nature. I said in my film on Antarctica there won't be a, a, a penguin, but then I got interested. There was a, a scientist who for 22 years has not spoken to anyone. Yes, he did. He was, uh, they told me uh, two months ago, he went to the medical station and he pointed at his ankle, ankle which was kind of sprained or, or some, some injuries, and he pointed to the doctor and said, the ankle. That was pretty much the last 
the only thing he said in the entire year, they said to me, you won't be able to speak to him, unthinkable. And I said, I will. And I may even have a penguin in my film. <laughs> and, uh, and very soon, uh, uh, I come to terms with him and he opens up and speaks to me. Do we have the clip? I don't yeah, know do, which actually. number it is. Uh, is it? It's Encounters it. at the End of the World, the Penguin. <laughs> yeah. How did you get him to talk then? Pardon? How did you build up that trust and comfort for him to open up to you and talk? Yeah, well, uh, I spoke about insanity of, of, uh, of, is there such a thing as insanity among animals? And I explained to him how I got my permit to go into Antarctica through the uh, National Science uh, Foundation in, in the United States. And I made a proposal and I, I was puzzling and musing over the question had nothing to do with Antarctica. I was fascinated that uh, species fairly low, like uh, certain termites, they breed or they keep uh, whole armies of slaves of certain lice, leaf lice, that create little droplets of sugar. They keep them as slaves and they harvest droplets of sugar. Why is a, is a creature like that capable of utilizing slaves? And why is it that we have never seen a chimp saddling a goat and riding into the sunset? <laughs> so they said to, that to Ernest Ainley, and they said about penguins, and is there insanity? And he, which comes a little bit before that clip, and he's, all of a sudden he opens up and he speaks about prostitution among uh, penguins. And I thought, well, that I have not heard in Disney. <laughs> and and I, I got... And he saw my, my kind of fascination and he started to open up. It's not much dialogue, but at least a few sentences. Um, we've run out of time for us to chat, but we're going to open up to our yeah. audience if, if you guys have some questions. We have some people with microphones, so if you have a question, please put your hand up and we'll try and sweep across the room as quickly as we can. So we've got a lady right there in the second row, and then anyone in this section... Anyone here? And then we get a microphone to that gentleman for next, and There's then someone here. Somebody with there a we go, microphone lady there. already. Please stand up and yes. get your question. Um, first of all, thank you so much. Can and you speak up a little bit? Thank you so much for what you said. Um, you helped justify the things that I do. I also did a film on Mikhail Gorbachev for History on Television. On, for, Mikhail on Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. For History Television Canada. And in order for me to be able to interview him, I lied. I told uh, Pavel, you know Pavel, um, that I'm a famous filmmaker in Canada, and uh, which I'm not, and that um, Yet. the not, <laughs> and <laughs> and that uh, our prime minister, who um, is conservative, so I didn't speak to him. Um, it meant everything for me to make that film, to um, you know, because our prime minister was such a fan of Gorbachev's. And with those lies, I was able to make the film. So when, when did you make the film, if I may ask? Uh, in 2000 and, uh, 2007, I actually uh -huh, yeah. interviewed him twice, one on, for Sakharov, and then I was able to make a film on oh, Gorbachev. Yeah. So you were 10 years ahead of me with your film, which unfortunately I haven't seen. Well, you, so I, I, well, I couldn't learn from your film, but... Uh, <laughs> um, I'm happy to share it with you. And I yes, was very I, I'm emotional. I'm still fascinated by him, yeah. and uh, he, um, he's not in good health. I, know. I think we know that. Uh, and, uh, Do you keep in touch with him? Pardon? Do you keep in touch with him? N not, you can't really. You can only do it through intermediaries, through because he, most of the time he would be in hospital and connected to some uh, whatever tubes. And uh, it's, it's very precarious. Yeah. And, uh, of course, uh, we sent him the film and he actually saw it in public a year ago and uh, was very warmly welcomed. Uh, the, the tragedy about him is that a good part of the Russian uh, uh, people see him a traitor. And it's a very tragic misunderstanding. It seems to warm up towards him now. I hope again. so. So, uh, but I think uh, your attitude, uh, talking about the Prime Minister, whether 
you have ever spoken to the Prime Minister or no, not? Never. Yes, of course, that's fine. <laughs> you deserve your luck. You, Thank you. You earned it. You earned it. It was the very right emotional way. for me to see your film. Yes. Thank you. We have a, someone here with them. There we go, right there. Hello. Good morning, Mr. Herzog. Thank you again for being a constant inspiration for me personally. I'm been always intrigued by your films and your ideas on the intellectual level. However, this morning I'm a little bit intrigued to hear a little bit about your ideas, maybe about love, marriage, and emotions. The only um, point I got some of this huge emotions from your films was the ending of, the, of your documentary, The Land of Silence and Darkness, the brother hugging a tree by the end of the film with the music of yeah. Bach, I believe. I would really love to hear from you about marriage, long relationships, if you have any idea. Uh, yeah, but uh, it it's shouldn't be much in a masterclass. Let's make it short. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very lucky man, happily married. That's, and that's the reason why I live in Los Angeles, not in Hollywood. I live there and uh, my wife is Russian born and I'm a, a, I'm a truly lucky man. So I'm with her since uh, 24 years and 10 months and six days, Aww. and it and it has, <laughs> has has been like um, like honeymoon every day. But <clears throat> what what I, I I have an advice to because everybody says how do you manage and how does it hold that strongly? Uh, much of it is banalities. It's maintenance, maintenance. The daily watching out. Uh, uh, do I get on her nerve? Do I do the right thing? Have I made a mistake? Do I pay attention? Do I uh, keep silent at the right moment? <laughs> yes, sure, sure. And it's, it's, it's very, very much maintenance in my advice is whenever you fall in love, and it's really big and important, uh, uh, love cannot be replaced by anything, uh, but uh, maintenance will, will uh, give you a long long, happy life. So. That's a good answer. And we have a gentleman here with a question as well. Anyone else? Just put your hands yeah. up. We'll get next to you. Great. Hi, Werner. Uh, thank, thank you for your film yesterday. Uh, it, was a, it was a really great film. Uh, yesterday, you mentioned uh, that a filmmaker who uh, doesn't read uh, will only ever be a mediocre filmmaker. And uh, I went on your website, and uh, th there's a, there is a small reading list there. It's got some interesting things like the Warren Commission report and things like that. Um, I'm hoping that you'd be uh, willing to update that or give a, uh, a bigger list. Uh, but <coughs> my specific question is, uh, 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 when you look back on your life, uh, how do you uh, uh, navigate between your personal life uh, and all the responsibilities you have, like you know, to pay bills and things like that, with uh, uh, the work of an artist and uh, uh, and you know, like uh, you know, the life of the nomad and, and going to the far-flung places? Uh, how do you navigate the two? Do you have any advice on that? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, there's uh, basically two questions. One is. Uh, uh, about how I, I navigate through a long-term sort of uh, filmmaking life. Uh, uh, I cannot really say what it is. I'm always looking for more long-term relationships with, let's say, pro production people or a crew or um, with uh, a musician who would contribute music not only for this film but for, for next film. And of course, being responsible with money. And I started out uh, early when I was 15, 16, I wanted to make films. But I was thrown out of every office uh, of producers and TV and whatever. So I knew I had to be alone, I had to be self-reliant. And I worked the night shift as a welder uh, in a steel factory. And during day I was in school for two, two and a half years almost. So I became self-reliant, earned money and started with my first short films in 35 millimeter celluloid. Long range you will survive when, when you are really careful about what you are doing and the intensity of how you are doing things. 
and secondly, um, becoming independent, independence is not a good word, but self-reliant of the industry and finances. Today you can make a long one and a half hour feature film for under 5,000 5, pounds. You can make a feature film, a narrative feature film for theaters under 15 or 20,000 pounds. So if necessary, earn the money. If you are able-bodied, uh, earn the money somehow and, uh, and roll up your sleeves and do it on your own. So that's, that's how you can always survive. And, and it will not kill you off uh, wasting, quote unquote, 5,000 pounds, but you have a whole film. It may never be sold, but, but it will not kill you off. But what kills you off if you are into a one and a half million dollar project with National Geographic, and it turns out to be a flop, and National Geographic hates it. That's probably the end of your career for the next 10 years until you scramble back up on your feet. So you have to be bold and, uh, and, and looking ahead of what you are doing and, and try not to shoot too much, try to be focused, try to, uh, try to be professional. And professional means don't shoot 600 hours of, of footage. If you do that, you don't know what you are doing. It's, uh, so, but you had a first part of your question, sorry. The reading list. The reading list. Uh, don't get, well, when you look in online, uh, the, the Rogue Film School, I have a mandatory reading list and those who attend have to read at least three or four of the five or six books that I, that I mentioned, but it could be 500 others. It's not the books, none of the books is about filmmaking. I have never read a book about filmmaking in my life. I've never been in film school. So avoid all that crap. Don't, <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. It, uh, and, uh, but there's one book I would like to mention, which is on the list. It's called The Peregrine. Uh, obscure British writer J.A. Baker published it in, I think, 1967. And today it has become a minor bestseller. It's it's a very narrow view of the world. It's only observing peregrine falcons when they were at the brink of extinction. There were only 14 breeding pairs still alive in the United Kingdom. Today they have bounced back. And, and the kind of precision of observation and the passion, an, an, an unbelievably passion of what he sees there. And it's absolutely not sentimentalization and anthropomorphization of nature. It's, it's a stark, naked, incredible view at nature. And, I, and if you're a filmmaker, you have to have this relentless gaze. The poet must not avert his eyes. You just look at things, never avert your eyes. Do it with a great passion for what, what you are observing. Do it with a precision. So, uh, and, and besides uh, the peregrine in some parts of the book, it is prose of a caliber we have not seen since Joseph Conrad. So, and I, I keep advertising the book everywhere I have a chance because it is so wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have someone over here. Yeah, there we go. Hello, stand up. Hello, Werner. Grüß dich. Yeah. Grüß dich. Um, we saw your Nomad film last night and enjoyed it. And in that, you um, mentioned Lotte Eisner as a, um, a mentor. So I wondered whether you feel a responsibility and a drive to encourage other filmmakers. Uh, Lotte way. Eisner. Uh, well, she, uh, there's a long story behind her being Jewish. She had to flee uh, Germany at the, at the very moment Hitler took power and she was in hiding in France and she was one of the great spirits of, uh, of cinema and she was uh, <clears throat> working with Henri Longlois who had founded the Cinémathèque in Paris, the first Cinémathèque ever. And, and she was very important for me and also for the young filmmakers uh, around me in the early times uh, of our filmmaking. And she encouraged me uh, and, and kept pointing out 
finally, after the barbarism of the Nazi time, there's legitimate culture, film culture again in Germany. And I really owe her a lot. And when she was dying, I was called, Lotte is dying, come quickly. I looked into uh, train schedules and flight schedules. And then I said, now I will come on foot. And I took a reading of a compass and I went straight, straight, straight to Paris on foot. Uh, things of existential uh, importance I would do on foot. And I traveled uh, something like 900 kilometers against snowstorm and ice and sleet and rain. And, and when I arrived, she was out of hospital. I would not allow her to die. <laughs> and she didn't know I was coming. She actually didn't know. And, and then later when she, uh, she was 80 at that time, but she lived another eight years or so. And uh, then she summoned me back to Paris and she said, now come by train, come quickly. So I came and she said to me, uh, listen, I, I'm almost blind now. I cannot read anymore the joy of my life reading, the joy of my life watching movies. I can't do anymore. I'm almost paralyzed, I cannot walk anymore. And she said something very biblical, like Noah, having lived 920 years, died saturated of life. And she used exactly the same biblical term, always casually. She says, now I'm saturated of life. Can you, but there's still this spell upon me that I must not die. Can you lift it? And I said, sure, Lottie, it's lifted here hereby and she died eight days later. And I had the feeling it was good and I said to her, if you die now, it's fine, good. It's, it, would be, it would be quite all right, acceptable. And she died eight days later. So I'm not superstitious, but uh, there was some, some sort of a, of a deep quest, a pilgrimage out there. And many of my films are in fact pilgrimages. Um, and some of it are uh, even uh, done by the barefoot pilgrim. So uh, it's, she, she was very, very important for me. That's all I can say. Okay, and then we've got someone with a microphone there. Hello. Stand up, yeah. there we go. Hello. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about working with Harmony Corrine um, and how you found working with mm -hmm. him. Well, uh, Harmony Corrine was... Uh, uh, f searching for me and uh, actually found me and I, I'm some sort of a mentor for him. Um, and he, uh, his all-time favorite, he has two all-time favorite films, but one of the two is Even Dwarfs Started Small. He said he would kill for seeing the film <laughs> if necessary. And, uh, and then he, he wanted me to act in one of his films, actually, Julian Donkey Boy, as his father, and he said to me, uh, it's a very personal story about a crazy family uh, and, a, and a hostile, dysfunctional father uh, presiding over a crazed family, and I will play your son. And I arrive on the set, and, and he was not my son anymore. He, was, he hired an actor, and I said, Harmony, you cheated me. He said, no, no, I just thought, this actor was better, so. And, and, the, and then there was no real screenplay, and there was, for example, one scene with uh, my family uh, on the table, a crazed grandmother and a, a daughter that was impregnated by her crazy brother and another brother who is a wrestler and a loser. And, and I'm sitting with them, and, and there had to be dialogue at the kitchen table. I only knew I had to put them down, I had to be hostile. And I see they had multiple cameras. I see the little lights already on it. I turn over to Harmony and I say, Harmony, are we rolling? And he nods, are we really rolling? And he says, we are rolling. And I say, what, what is the dialogue? What's the dialogue? And he says, speak. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? I concocted something. I put down my son who tries to read a poem to me and I really put him down. And then I speak about uh, the end of Dirty Harry, how, how Harry blasts a bad guy away, and at the end, when everybody runs out of bullets, and Harry knows that he still has one, one bullet left in his gun, 
and he looks at the bad guy who's on the ground and trying to click at him and he says to the bad guy, you have to ask yourself one question, am I lucky? So, and I, uh, I, I'm speaking about Dirty Harry all of a sudden, but it was out, born out of the need of things. <laughs> and I've been in another film by him, and uh, no, he's a very fine, a very, very, very talented young man, sometimes too undisciplined. That's uh, when, when you, are, you, you, have to, you have to pair talent and with some portion of discipline as well. And all the great composers, for example, were, were disciplined, disciplined workers as well, a part of the great musical inspiration they had. And you have to, you have to work like a composer of, of music. Yes, there is inspiration and there is melody and there is something big going out, but writing it down and taking the time and focusing means a lot of discipline, so. What do you enjoy about acting? Well, I, I enjoy to do the things where I'm really good. So I, I accepted <laughs> being the badass bad guy in Jack Reacher because I knew I was hired to spread terror. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, uh, yes, I can do that. And uh, so I did it and it was good. I mean, I had a lot of offers. And I did, for example, recently something in The Mandalorian. Amazing. It's a spin-off of uh, Star Wars. And, and the screenplay really looked good and my part looked very interesting. And I said, yeah, I can do it. It's, it's not a, the bad-ass bad guy, but, but somebody you can't really trust. And I said, yeah, I, I can do it. And uh, so I accepted the offer. That was also in the last 12 months where I did the three films. Three films, The Mandalorian. And, and I had a, a, master, a, a workshop in the Peruvian jungle with young filmmakers who had to make a film within 10 days. Wow. So it was really pressure on them. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I do only things where I know I, I would be good. <laughs> and for Jack Reacher, they paid me handsomely. And, Always attractive. And, and it, comes, it comes very easily to me. And I, I learned something in, in the early phase of uh, Fitzcarraldo. There was Mick Jagger as the sidekick of the leading character. Uh, and he plays a, a retarded, a demented Englishman with a huge turn-of-the-century barber chair on his back and reciting uh, uh, Richard III, the opening soliloquy. I mean, incredible, and, and Jagger had something uh, in him that was amazing. He would be out uh, arguing about, God knows, the mineral water or, <laughs> or, or the per diem, and I said, Mick, uh, the camera is rolling. He takes three steps, steps in front of the camera, and he's a demon. It's unbelievable, and I, I thought, I, I have to learn. And, and when they called me, I would step in, the, in front of the camera, and I would be... The, the really frightening bad-ass bad guy. So it, uh, I, I learned, of course, from some of the best of the best. Yeah. Do we have one here? Hello. Yeah. Anyone else around here? Just put your hand up. You get one up there, please. Hi, Werner. Thanks again. Uh, my question's about uh, actually how your personal narratives often intermingle with the main stories you're telling. And I'm wondering if you can talk about your process with your editors like Joe and Meyer and how you guys come to terms with where your narration is necessary and possibly sometimes where you don't go far enough and yeah. how you make that decision. Thank you. Yeah, I see it, uh, narration always comes during editing. I, I see uh, here that there has to be a bridge to the next chapter or so, I need to say something. Or I see, oh, this is uh, a little bit opaque, it has to be uh, in sharper focus, I have to make a commentary or I observe something that hardly anyone would see unless I pointed it out. Uh, so, I, for example, Treadwell seems to be hesitant to leave the last frame of his last video. And you actually start to see it now, how he's undecided and then finally leaves the frame. I write it instantly while we are sitting at the editing and I have a professional microphone right next to there. We switch things off and I immediately record it in studio quality. 
and then it turns out it's five seconds too long. So I have to stretch the image by five seconds, if it's possible. If not, I know I have to shorten the text, and I would do that. And while I'm, while I'm editing and plowing on, I write and speak and incorporate the, the commentary right then and there. And that's uh, the liveliest way to do it. Yep, great, yeah. thank you. We got someone up here? We should yeah, we got have one more question because I have to leave, unfortunately. I have to we catch a plane. We're yes. here ready for the last Please, one. Yeah. Morning, Werner. Uh, you've had some tough shoots in your career. Is there one film or one moment where the, the, the determination you're known for was beginning to fail you and you were thinking, I need to walk away from this project? Mm -hmm. No, uh, there's, uh, when you have started a film, there's only one way and nothing else. You have to finish it, no matter what. You have to, uh, you do not leave a film unfinished. And yes, of course, I have had very, very hard, difficult shots, uh, shootings. Fitzcarraldo, one of them, moving a ship over a mountain is not an easy task. <laughs> but, but the real, the, the film that, that was plagued more than and went beyond my control was Fata Morgana because I was, uh, I, I was taken prisoner in, in uh, Africa and uh, you don't have control over your film anymore when you're in a prison cell. <laughs> and, and besides, I had malaria in Bilatia, a very serious blood parasite disease at the same time. So uh, I, I was not in control of anything anymore. And I could not be transported any further. I was too ill. Uh, so, uh, and, and yet I finished the film. Uh, I, I was flown out of the Central African Republic and then somehow continued shooting the film while I was shooting my film. Even Dwarfs started small, but very early on, and I was a very young filmmaker at the time, it, it was clear to me uh, yes, you can buy half a bread at the bakery, that's fine, you can do that, but there is no such thing as half a film. You have, to <clears throat> you have to master the courage and the perseverance uh, that, that's in you, and you have to learn about this. Actually, uh, what has always given me courage is a proverbial saying that I heard in the, uh, in the Peruvian jungle, uh, it goes, uh, la perseverancia es donde los dioses. Perseverance is where the gods dwell. So, learn that. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Werner Herzog. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.